directors on startup boards or early stage company boards need to recognize that the their job is to capture the the future that is possible not and to support the team and the founders to to achieve that not to create governance and um, risk management to protect what is currently there Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 125 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Bhargava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have the venture partner at Giant Leap Fund, Adam Milgram, as my guest for this episode. Alongside his role at the Giant Leap Fund, Adam is also an angel investor, advisor, and director to a number of Australian and international startups. Giant Leap Fund is Australia's first venture capital fund to be 100% dedicated to investing in impact startups. Rapidly scalable businesses that blend financial returns with real and measurable social and environmental benefits. Through the Giant Leap Fund and his own angel investments, Adam has invested in over 20 startups, including Applied, Mindset and Amber Electric. And he also sits on the board of two of his investment companies, Future Super and Your Grocer. In this interview, we covered a wide range of topics, including treating fundraising as a sales process, how to leverage your investors for growth, treating decision-making as a muscle, how VCs approach portfolio building, and much more. Without further ado, here's my interview with Adam Milgram. Adam, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to, to join us on this podcast. Hey, Rohit, great to be here. Uh, it's taken us a very long time to get here um, for those people that are, that are listening in. So I'm, I'm really stoked to finally get you on the show. But Adam, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the highlight reel. I think probably most pertinent to why I'm here today, I started working um, with agencies about 15 years ago. And the, my main job was really helping big companies understand the internet. Um, it was a time when it was clear the internet was going to be a thing, but most companies didn't really believe that it was where their customers would be or that it would really impact their businesses. And so I spent about 10 years banging my head against a brick wall, trying to convince these big companies that the internet was real, that customers really wanted to talk to them there, um, that there were big opportunities there. And then I had this opportunity with a friend who had a startup and was helping him out. And it was just so different to working with big companies. Uh, with the with big companies, like it felt like you were having meetings to just have meetings. Um, with my friend, it was like every time, the, if you're going to have a meeting, it was because something was getting done. And I found that infectious and I loved it. And I also didn't have to convince him the future was coming. He was excited about it. And so I just wanted to work with more startups. There was, it was clear, it was very clear back then, um, which was seven, eight years ago, that the startups weren't going to be able to pay me the way big companies had. And so I needed to find a different model. Uh, and I was lucky um, to team up with the team at Giant Leap as they were building that fund to help them kind of crystallize their thought process um, and build that fund and now get to work with that team uh, to help them deploy capital um, and work with startups full time. Yeah, obviously, there's a lot that we'll get into, especially on the investing and, and the Giant Leap side of things. But, uh, you know, you touched on something a little bit earlier uh, in terms of some of your background and I guess being against the drum and, and trying to get people to, to look at things a little bit differently. Like, I think a lot of our experiences shape how we um, shape how we sort of view the world or, or I guess what we want to do in the future, both for positive or for negative. But I guess what were some of the lessons that you learned from your experience? I think you were at Hype DC Shoes for a little while. And from what I understand as well, your first uh, one of your first roles was in chartering. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that what that was? And I guess what were some of the lessons that you took from from some of those experiences and how has that shaped how you view the world now? You, you're digging deep into the archives. I'm not sure what you mean by charting, um, but um, the the role that I have this is, so I, I, I work both agency side um, in um, across kind of strategy and branding and um, communications and also client side. My role with Hype DC was building their first um, website or their first um, e-commerce platform. And I worked with um, developers uh, to deliver that. And it, it came, it was interesting because their website before that was just a one single page, which listed where their stores were. And they didn't really believe that they could sell shoes online. Uh, but at the time, Zappos was gaining traction. 
in the US. And so they gave me a budget of $100,000 to, to see what I could do. Um, and so I, it, was, it was kind of a self-contained project. I, I got to put the team together uh, and we launched uh, that website about 12 months after I started with the company. And that completely changed the game. It wasn't, from a technological point of view, selling on, online was already a thing. But from a systems point of view, their entire system had to change. And so their logistic systems had to change. The way they remunerated staff had to change because they were remunerated on store sales um, or meeting budgets. And if we were selling online, who did, who did that go to? And so there was a big uh, psychological and internal change that had to happen to allow it. But that store quickly grew to one of their top performing stores, better than most of their retail outlets and beca has become a really important part of their business. So for me, that was a really interesting learning. Uh, it was also one of the few stores that we could see significant week on week, month on month growth, where in, in the normal land of retail, you're lucky to get 10% year on year growth. We, we could start to push that on a week on week basis. So I think that that definitely bit the, Took, took a bit of a bug for me in terms of building this. But what, what I really came out of that learning is that I cared not at all about selling shoes. Um, and I think that was also part of the reason why I ended up with Giant Leap is because I, I realized that if I was going to use these skills that I'd learned and I was going to help people sell things or build bigger businesses, I really wanted to care what, what they were doing. Um, and selling shoes just wasn't, wasn't going to cut it for me. And so I think being able to team up with uh, a team that really cared about the impact of the companies they back um, spoke really strongly to me. Yeah, I think just kind of picking up on one of your points, and this might be sort of relevant to a lot of the startups that are listening as well that are probably at that earlier stage. I guess it's much easier to convince people when you kind of see that month on month growth and you see that sort of upward trajectory. What does that look like in terms of building that trust internally to invest or kind of double down on an area when you potentially don't have those data points in place? Um, what does that sort of look like when, I guess, you're faced with a bunch of skepticism, especially when things are done in a very particular way and you're asking them to change the entire business? Uh, yeah, it's a real struggle. And a lot of businesses don't have the uh, confidence or they don't have the belief um, that something like that this for for hype dc this was a tiny project um they did re like that was not a big budget for them although it was an important project it, it certainly wasn't one where they were prepared to spend a huge amount of money and part of part of it for me is it was clear that continued investment into this area was going to pay dividends but it wasn't a vision they they shared um and so we did get to a point where we had to pla well, kind of plateaued that growth and I think that that's fairly common in big businesses where they don't feel confident going all in on, on an idea. I think that that's one of the reasons why I find startups so exciting is because they, uh, they, they, they have a belief, a vision of the future that is very different from today. I think in, in big businesses, uh, I would say like in a general sense, this is certainly not the case for all big businesses, but in a general sense, they feel like they have a lot to lose. And they feel like a lot of the work they need to do is protecting the status quo, whereas startups normally don't have anything to lose, right? Like it's, it's the future that they don't achieve that is really the, the thing they have to lose. Um, and so if that's your mentality, you need to do everything you can do to chase that future down. And that puts a completely different uh, mind frame on every employee in that company because you're not trying to protect what you've got today. You're really trying to create what you need for the future. Speaking of creating for the future, what did that sort of journey look like for you from sort of being in a position where you realized that, you know, selling shoes wasn't really what you wanted to do for a living to, uh, to your kind of journey to Giant Leap? What, what was that sort of process and journey like? Yeah, so it was pretty meandering, I would say. I, I did a bunch of different stuff um, in that time. The, I, I knew I wanted to have more impact. Uh, so the first thing that I, I thought was that I would go and work with not-for-profits and help them and bring kind of a business brain to the not-for-profit world. And it was very clear very quickly that they they did not want to think the, about the world in the way that I wanted to think about the world. I, I, I thought about the world that you could think about donors as customers and think about your um, beneficiaries as 
uh, the recipients of your product and thinking about how do you make sure the product and the beneficiaries and the customers or the donors work together. It's very, um, it's, it's not a world that, or not a way that philanthropy wants to think. And so that didn't quite work for me. I did as many coffee meetings as I could. I spoke to literally anyone who would take the time to speak to me. I started doing some small angel investments. I made a couple of investments in of five or $10,000 which was within the means that I had at the time and let me kind of go through the process. I definitely feel like I'm the type of person who learns by doing and nothing teaches you about a term sheet or a shareholder agreement as much as putting your own money uh, into that process. Um, and part of that was meeting Danny Almagor, who's the founder of Small Giants and um, Impact Investment Group, which owns Giant Leap Fund. And... We, we had a great conversation. He really pushed me to think about exactly what I wanted to be doing. Um, and one of the things that they were doing, and um, particularly Will Richardson was building this venture capital fund. And so one of those meetings was with Will. Um, and it kind of, it brought everything that I was doing together. And I found that, uh, I felt really lucky to have found that. And it's been a great partnership since. Uh, you, so Giant Leap is probably the first, if to my understanding, the only impact investing fund in Australia uh, at the moment. And obviously, it's it's a term that's um, a lot more common and a little bit better understood now. But especially for the listeners that may not be as familiar with how impact investing works, do you want to just give a, a quick sort of rundown of, of what it is? Yeah. So there's, there's lots of different flavors of impact investing, but um, and it's an, it is becoming more well understood, but our interpretation is looking for companies where the the business model creates some kind of social or environmental positive impact through its business, uh, which can be measured. And so we we will look for companies where that is true. If a giant leap, we we look specifically for seed and series A companies and we, we go through a framework of what the theory of change for that company might be, what impact it wants to have, and whether, whether that is aligned, whether that actually the business actually provides that level of impact or could provide that level of impact as it scales, and then uh, whether the founder is motivated by that impact, whether they're driven to create impact, and um, also how we might be able to measure that. And the measurement is normally a step that comes later, particularly with early stage companies, there's not a lot to measure, but we do need to have a feeling that there is something to measure um, and that we would be able to put numbers behind this and be able to compare against an alternative world where this didn't exist and know that what we were doing did have some positive impact. And I guess one of the things to, worth noting there is we certainly believe that these will return from a financial point of view, at least as much as a, a traditional company. We see that employees want to work for companies that have a positive impact, that have a really strong purpose. And we see that customers want to buy from companies that want to, that have a really strong mission and have a strong purpose. And so we, we think this is a great business opportunity as well. Uh, on that, like, I guess, how do you, what comes first when you're assessing, when a startup comes to you, do you sort of look at it from a, a pure sort of investment lens or do you sort of focus on the impact first and then um, on, I guess, the structure of the business? Yeah, so we do, um, we screen all new opportunities for two things. Um, one is commercial viability and the other is impact um, viability and they have to pass both screen to be considered further. And so that's the very first thing. It's, it's fairly light touch. It's, um, it, it doesn't go into the details, but it's sort of like, is there a business model here that could work? Is the company, um, has the company got some traction around that business model? That's kind of the commercial side. And from an impact point of view is like, that does what they do create impact? And about, I'm not going to get the numbers exactly right. Uh, I think somewhere between 30 and 40% of the companies we look at will meet um, both of those hurdles on the at the, in the first time um, as they come through our our screen. And you know, I guess from a from a founder perspective, it's always interesting to know what the investment process looks like, or kind of like lifting the lid. Do you want to share what what does that process look like from a giant leap perspective? From I guess the first time, let's say the first time that someone reaches out to you to the point that you get um, the point that you offer a term sheet. What what does that 
uh, what does that framework look like? So, as I said, the fir very first thing we'll do is do a screen. Um, normally, we we'll, we can do that without having met the company. So either off a deck or um, even just looking at their website or from prior knowledge, just to make sure we're not wasting anybody's time. Um, if if it fits the mandate of the fund, normally there'll be an initial meeting with one or two people from the Giant League team. There's six on the team and um, we, we all meet on a weekly basis to talk through all the live deals. So if someone has met with a company they think is interesting, it will then be discussed at our weekly deal call and um, providing that there's support from other, other partners to continue a conversation will then have, normally we'll have a pitch meeting with more partners or all the partners together. And each of these steps are kind of a go or no go. So the ideal for us is that we say no as quickly as possible if we know that it's, it's a no, um, or we'll progress to the, to the next stage. And as we progress, we're always asking what the threshold questions um, to progress to the next stage or to, to be able to invest. Like what are the real things that matter here? Yeah, it's not like, there's a whole bunch of information we could get, um, but a lot of that won't help us make a good decision. And then normally the process will be a couple more of those meetings and a, it will then kickstart a more formal due diligence process. I'm really lucky that I work with Rachel and Charlie and Will who do most of the heavy list, lifting on that process. I, I, get to, um, I get to see the fruits of their labor, but I don't, I don't get too deep into the weeds on that. And they'll come back to us with questions, with feedback from their investigations, and we'll continue to have these conversations internally to make sure that we're on track with that investment. And if it's one that we are excited about um, and we want to we want to pursue, we'll uh, start to talk to, about, to the founder about a term sheet and then submit a formal paper internally uh, for approval for that investment um, and then work through legals and then money gets sent to bank accounts. Um, and I guess that from a timing point of view, that process can take as short as four to six weeks, but also as long as eight to 10, depending on our comfort with the marketplace, our comfort with the, the founding team and our relationship with them and uh, how, how, how deep the diligence pack is or how, how much data there is in the data room or how much traction they have or how much information we can get, um, the, more, the more information that's available, potentially the, the faster we can move. But it is, but it is a process and I, I think that it's unwise to rush given how important the decision is from both sides. I think founders um, want to make sure that the, the investors they get are the right kind of investors for them. And obviously as investors, we really want to make sure that we, are, we understand how founders are thinking, what decisions they're making, because we're, we're backing their train. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I don't think that you want to rush that process. Um, you know, a lot of it is sort of relationship building and, and building up trust. But at the same time, uh, you know, I've spoken to plenty of founders that have been, uh, let's say, like, I, I think it's very similar to a sales process, um, you know, like trying to sell to enterprise where there's kind of always like a delay or kind of things that just get dragged on, which is almost inevitably, inevitably going to be a no. But you kind of live on the hope that it will turn into turn into a yes. It, do you have any um, suggestions on how founders can sort of get to a quicker no? If if they can't get to a quicker yes, is there is there processes that they can use to qualify investors a little bit sooner to kind of gauge whether uh, there is a possibility of a yes or, or kind of uh, or at least get to a quicker no so that they can at least move on? Yeah, I think that, so. Your characterization of it as a sales process is exactly how I would think about it, um, and I think it is about qualifying investors. It's um, and asking the right questions. So the questions that I would be asking investors is, um, what what stage do you like to invest? What check size do you like to write? And not about my startup, but just in general. Like, what what do you like to do? Um, what what is what has gotten you to invest in this other company that you've invested in and I think that that at least you can qualify like if they're the right kind of investor for you if what they like to do how do you like to be involved in startups post investment those kind of questions and I think I don't think you should be shy about asking those I think that uh, you there are some investors who won't know the answers but you shouldn't feel bad for asking 
and they should be honest if they don't know the answers or if they're still if they're still figuring that out and then i think you need to remember those answers and remind them later on and say like you said you like to invest when companies are like that like this and that we are now at that stage or we're getting close to that stage uh would we be a good investment candidate for you and really gently kind of accelerate that conversation and to towards something i think that where, where it gets stuck is if someone says i'll oh, just keep me in the loop and you just generally keep them in the loop and not and not accelerate it and and say hey i've kept you in the loop for a while we're now raising would you be interested like that to kind of like push it I haven't, i've been with my wife for uh about 18 years so i haven't done it for a long time but i i imagine that it's fairly similar to dating as well i think a combination of sales and dating is probably how to think about this. And if you want to move forward, it does take some momentum and some uh, acceleration there. Yeah, and especially on the, on the sales side, uh, I guess if to be an effective salesman, you can't be the one talking all the time. Like you really want to be uh, you know, asking questions. That's, that's what an effective sales uh, strategy sort of looks like. So I think, you're, I think your insight in, in just asking the right questions at the right time and making sure that you're accelerating that um, is just fantastic advice as well. You mentioned a little bit early in terms of, you know, nothing teaches you more about, uh, you know, negotiating and term sheets than putting your own money in. What are some of the things that founders should uh, think about from a term sheet perspective in terms of what is and what isn't important? What are kind of specific things that they should be mindful of or, or what are things that are, I guess, fairly standard and, and not worth spending as much time on as they might think? Yeah, so the first thing I'd recommend, which I, I'm assuming has been recommended before, but is to read the book Venture Deals uh, by Brad Feld. Uh, it's an exceptional resource and goes through line by line on a term sheet, at least from a US perspective, which is fairly similar here. What each term means, why investors care about it, what what might be fair in that context. I think that the other the other thing that I'd look at is think about the 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 chart you want, the course you want to chart. If the course you want to chart is one where you raise money from a, a major VC in Australia, that we all have very similar kind of approaches. We, we would look at um, a, a very similar a term sheet with preference shares and um, some kind of information rights and potentially board seats and some, some downside protection. And um, so you can have a look at the various term sheets, Airtree have got a good one that they've, a seed term sheet that they've published and at least understand what, what that market looks like if you, are, if you think you're gonna go down that path. It's, it's not impossible, but it's quite difficult to unscramble the egg if you've got a shareholders agreement or a previous investment that looks vastly different from that. And I think that the, every founder, every investor uh, thinks they're a special snowflake and that, they, that, that their opportunity is so different that their shareholders agreement should look very different from everyone else's. My recommendation is that unless that's absolutely necessary to avoid that and to keep it as vanilla and standard as possible, um, but also to speak to your investor and understand why, like if they're pushing hard on a term, it's almost, that it's almost always going to be that they have been burnt previously, um, or they know someone else who's been burned, or they can imagine how they would be burnt if they didn't have this term. And so I think it's worth having the conversation to actually understand it. it you shouldn't feel bad to say to your investor that this, this seems different to you and doesn't feel like something that should, should be worried about in this case. But at the end of the day, I think that the, the success of the business will, will come down to what you do in the business. And as long as you have fairly vanilla agreements, they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't get in your way. You spoke a little bit earlier about the investment process that you go through from, uh, from a venture capital perspective. What are some of the criteria that you, that you look for when, when making these investments? And I guess how, if at all, does that differ when you're making your sort of own personal angel investments? Yeah, so for Giant Leap, we look to write checks of around $500,000 for a Series A company. That's kind of our sweet spot. We've done some smaller checks into companies that were really promising that were up and coming. But really, uh, to, to qualify for that uh, main investment, we would be looking at a company that was 
on track to do about a million dollars in revenue in the forward year. So growing fast, revenues coming in. Uh, I think that that for us um, is because we really want to understand why customers are buying your product. We want to understand the problem that it's solving. And as you get to those kind of numbers, you've got enough customers to start to understand that. You can understand the customer lifetime value. You can understand that how much it costs you to acquire a customer. And those metrics are really helpful for us to understand where your business is, where, where the opportunity for more capital might be and where, where we're solving new problems or where, where we're putting fuel on the fire to accelerate problems you've already been solved and that we, we now have opportunities to take advantage of. And we get, we're comfortable in both zones, but um, I think as you progress, you, it's more clear which of those the company really needs. And so we make sure we, we know what kind of assistance we're giving. And then for my personal angel investments, there's, there's far less structure. I think that uh, I, was, I was thinking about like, we are chatting and I was thinking about like, well, why I make angel investments. I think the, the honest answer is because I can't help myself. I get super excited. I see companies that don't fit necessarily the mandate of Giant Leap. Um, they might be too early stage, they might be too late stage, and they, but they're super promising and they're solving a problem that I personally really care about. And they've got founders who I think will really execute really well. And I, where, where it's been most successful is where the, that intersection of like problem I really care about and founders I really back. And I think that that has probably kind of clouded me on everything else. So I don't, I don't, I certainly don't have the same process that Giant Leap has when they go through their formal process to make an investment when I'm doing my angel investment. Speaking of founders, you really back. So in doing research for this interview, I did speak to, I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name, um, Morgan, who is the co-founder and CEO of your grocer which is one of your portfolio companies and you also sit on the board of um, as well. And one of the things that he mentioned was that um, during our conversation was that you're one of the most supportive investors that he has on board. And, uh, you know, I guess a lot of the time there's so much emphasis and focus on trying to get the investment through the door. Obviously a lot of investors themselves speak about, you know, value above and beyond specifically the dollars that they're putting into the company. What does that look like from an investment perspective? And I guess how should founders approach uh, utilizing the investors that they have once they have the capital in place? How can they make them as part of the team or kind of use them to just sort of supercharge the, the company? Yeah, so I'll start by saying Morgan taught me probably more than any other founder that I, I've been lucky enough to work with. So I, I feel very, very lucky to be able to work with Morgan. Uh, he's a fantastic founder. And I think that he, he has really nurtured a, a great relationship and we, we've been able to work together really well over a number of years. I think that the, the, the first thing is that from an investment point of view, I, I think investors need to understand that they're really backing someone else. That if they, if they want to do the work, um, this is the wrong game for them. Um, so I think that you, you need to have enough humility as an investor to say, that I, I'm on someone else's train. I, my job is to support them to, to maybe uh, guide that train or to suggest direction for where that train goes. But really, I, I'm not the driver. I'm kind of like at the back of the train. There's, like, there's the, the founders and then there's the, all the employees and, and then there's maybe the board of directors um, and then there's like kind of the angel investors or the investors who aren't on the board. And it's certainly not, not my job to tell Morgan what to do or to tell any founder what to do, um, but it is to support them. And so I think that in, in that context, what founders can do to get, get the best out of investors, the first is communication. I think if you're expecting more than platitudes from your investors, they have to have context. And so it doesn't matter how, how smart they are, how brilliant they are, what success they've had in their previous careers. If they don't understand the nuts and bolts that's really going on, the, in the business, the, the, the detail of it, they can't give you a nuanced piece of advice. And so I think that communication is really key and communicate often, communicate detail, share both the good things and the bad things that are coming. It's very hard to help when you only hear the good stuff um, because what, what help can you give? 
And so I think that, that for me, that that is the kind of bedrock of getting good help. I think the other thing from a uh, founder point of view to think about, uh, the best founders that I work with are the ones who have a wide network of people to ask advice from, but then they synthesize that advice internally and come up with their own decision. They're, they're not looking for someone to tell them what to do. They're looking for to stress test an idea that they've already had, or they're um, looking for potential solutions to a problem that they're solving. And they might go to two, three, four people, take nuggets of the, each of those and then come together with their own opinion and come back to you and say, hey, you gave me that this advice. I didn't follow it exactly, but I used that to build on this other piece of advice and we've, we're trialing this this thing and i think that really comes down to for me is like you're back in the intuition and the the thought and the kind of capabilities of founders to put all the stimulus that they put they get around them into a vision for the future and so i think the founders who do that are, are really successful but that doesn't come without work like that is a lot of work to be able to build that network of people that you can call to they might be board members they may be investors they may be other founders they may be employees who have left the company, employees who are in the company, and each one might be able to advise on a different thing. So uh, you might go to one group of people for UX questions, another for negotiation questions, another uh, for go-to-market strategy stuff. And knowing who to go to for what problems is really part of it. And putting that together and asking the right questions and then coming up with your own ideas. One of the things that you spoke you spoke about a little bit early in this interview was uh, the importance of being almost at the coalface of kind of really understanding the, and you spoke about kind of being involved in the nuts and bolts of the company. How important is it from a, uh, both from a founder, but also as you're sort of building out a team, um, I guess the difference between being a generalist or, or a specialist in a particular area. Um, and does that kind of shift at all when you sort of think about building, building the team or like focusing on investments at all? What's your kind of viewpoint on, uh, I guess, the, the value of generalists versus specialists in particular areas? Uh, so I'm certainly a generalist. Um, I think that w- one of the things that I know to be true about myself is that I work best across a portfolio of different things. And so I've, I've certainly chased that out. And I think that one of the reasons that helps me is because I can pick up something that I've learned from another company or another industry and bring it, bring it back to someone else and help contextualize it for them in their environment. I think that from a, a founder point of view, you can be a specialist or you can be a generalist. I think it helps if you know what you are to play to your strengths and to, to work out where, uh, where do you need to fill the gaps? I mean, certainly from my point of view, at the early stage of a company, you will have more generalists because you don't have enough people to do all the jobs as specialists. And actually having too many specialists can really slow you down. It is also certainly true that as you grow, you need to start filling some gaps with specialists and you need to find people who really know, know their craft at a level that, uh, that I, that I would never, or that a generalist could never because they're not in, in the detail as much as, as someone who's a real specialist in that area. And so, and for me, there's that's clear around technology that you can get, you can go very deep on specialists that be super valuable, but also in growth, uh, in UX, in product design, in customer relations, in human resources. And I think that as you grow that team, as you go from a three, five, 10 person company to a 20, 30, 40, 50 person company and beyond, those specialists become more and more important. But I think at the, at the early stage, as long as you know what you are, it doesn't actually matter. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it can be really hard to gauge what those sort of particular inflection points are as well. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, there's a range of different advice that, uh, that founders can get at, at various stages. Um, you kind of spoke about, you know, founders being able to distill that information to understand, you know, what is, what is right for them. Do you have any advice for, for founders on how they can make better decisions? Yeah, so I think that there, there's a truth about, being a founder or being a startup um, that you have to be comfortable making decisions with imperfect information that like you, and that is certainly a muscle and um, you can, you can practice that muscle and you can make 
you can make decisions. Um, you can make a process to help you make decisions better and to understand. Um, and I guess we, we do this from an investment point of view when we talk about the threshold issues that would make this investment. We, we, we certainly can't know if an investment is going to be a good investment or not. Um, we, we certainly can't predict um, what's going to happen with this company um, over three or five years time or 10 years time. Um, and I, I know with 100% certainty that more data won't answer those questions. And so the real, the real question is like, what data do I need to help me make this decision that I can at least get comfortable that I'm not making a stupid mistake? And um, I think that from a founder point of view, uh, there's, uh, there's a concept where it's like two-way two door decisions or one-way door decisions. So what are the decisions I can make where if I make it, I, I can go back if I need to go back or I can zig or zag. Um, and what are the decisions where I'm really betting the farm? And if it's, if it's a decision which is not like that is easy to reverse or easy to get out of or a small, a small departure, you should be able to make those decisions really quickly with very limited information because the cost of making the, the cost of not making that decision is much higher than the cost of making the decision because it's so easy to unwind. Decisions where you're betting the farm, um, those decisions should take more data and um, be more heavily considered and probably should take longer and should be stress tested to a much deeper level and also to be, to be investigated in a way of like, what are the things you could do to help you um, kind of uncover clues to what would happen if you made that decision without actually making the decision. And so an example for new product is, um, which I've seen used really successfully is people, have, people a lot of times will like spend a huge amount of time and resources to developing a new product. And a solution that I saw a company do was to actually just start advertising a product that they hadn't built. And they bought the Facebook ads and the Google ads and they created a website that basically just said coming soon. So they had the product up in lights on the ad and then you click the ad and the website told you it was coming soon to put your email address. And you don't need to run that test for very long to work out if anyone will click that ad. If anyone cares about the product you're trying to build, how much it might cost to acquire that customer. Once you get their email address, you can send them an email to ask them like why they filled in a form for a product that didn't exist and um, what solution, what part of the solution they were really tried for. And I think you can start to gauge whether there is enough there to make that decision a good decision. But, uh, but it's all about piecing together fragments of information. Yeah. And I think like investing is a perfect example of, I guess, making, making decisions when you have, imperfect sets of data, um, you know, especially when you're doing it at, at an earlier stage. I guess, you know, you would probably look at a couple of hundred um, in, investment opportunities a year and you probably only invest in a few, especially from, from a giant leap perspective. When you don't have that perfect data in place, what are the things that help get you across the line or what are the things that get you excited? What helps you pick those particular companies out of the, the hundreds that you're seeing each year? Yeah, so we look at a lot of companies. I think we'll look at somewhere between 800 and 1,000 uh, this year, and we'll probably make somewhere between around five investments, uh, which has been kind of our our cadence for the last couple of years. Uh, I think that the the things that are really special about the companies that we do choose to invest in is very much the team uh, is, a, is a huge part that we we believe we can back that team and we believe that the when they face hard decisions that they'll make when they face hard decisions that they'll really make good decisions that they'll they'll choose a path that will propel them forwards uh, so i think that's a huge part of it certainly the traction to date and um their their proof that they've been able to uncover uh, overcome obstacles uh, i think is a huge huge part of that and certainly we don't expect companies to be smooth sailing like it's not it's not just up and to the right at all times and so it really is more in the in the tough times that you see what someone might be made of uh, the the other part of it for us is that we believe in the market opportunity and so that the, that if this problem were to be solved that it would be a lucrative problem to solve. And so that comes down to the business model that comes down to uh, 
how many people might want this problem to be solved or how expensive it might be to connect to those people. And uh, that, that kind of is the, broadly what we would look for. Uh, but it's, but it is very subjective. And so we work very hard to kind of uh, reduce our unconscious bias and to make sure that we're making as good decisions as possible in that. Uh, one of the ways uh, that investors mitigate against that risk of making a bad decision is to, to have a portfolio approach. And so we'll, we'll have 20 plus companies in our portfolio for the exact reason that we know we need a spread to be able to uh, hit the targets that we've got. And because we can't be sure that any one investment is the exact right investment. Interesting. What, what does uh, putting together a portfolio look like from a VC or, or even a personal um, sort of angel investment perspective? How do you, you know, what, what's the structure? What are the things that you're looking for? How do you sort of look at the end result of a portfolio while you're, while you're making investments? Yeah. So um, I think from a fundamental point of view, Giant Leap is a $15 million portfolio. One of the reasons we write $500,000 first checks is because when we did the maths, we were looking at how many investments we wanted to be able to get and how much follow on capital we wanted to be able to allocate into the companies once we'd invested them in them. And $500,000 became the right amount for that first check. Um, we reserved about half our um, fund for follow on. And so if you take, um, half of $15 million and you, you cut it up um, into 500K chunks, you get um, the right, the kind of 20, 23, 25 um, investments, which is the, the, the right kind of number of investments um, that we felt that we were getting enough diversity across the fund where we could find the companies who would outperform as well as finding enough opportunities. And so we, 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 we started from that. And then as we progress, we, we think about more how to allocate our follow on capital to make sure that that money is going into the companies with the best future potential. And uh, one thing that we haven't really spoken about as much is, is I guess, board composition and, and I guess when the right time is for, for companies to put a board together. Can you share a little bit from, from your perspective of, of being an investor that sits on a board? What, how should a board function you know, how should a founder think about putting together the board and also when is the right time to, to actually start putting, putting a formal board structure together as well? A lot of questions. Yeah. There. So I'll, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll try and hit all of them, but if I forget any, just remind me, I don't, I don't think there is necessarily a right or wrong time to set, to set up a board. I think it, it depends on the company. In a lot of cases, the hand is forced by an investor who will say that like with this investment, uh, I would like to have a board seat. That's, that's certainly um, the case for a lot of companies and that will formalize that relationship. I think that the, from a founder point of view, there's, a, there's an advantage to setting up a board even when you're just founders. And for me, that's to make sure that the founders are thinking with their kind of director hats on as well as their functional hats. And so you might be the CTO and you're in the weeds of the development, but if you're the founder of a company and you're a director, um, you have comment on culture and strategy. And it's, it's really important that you feel the agency to, to think broadly about the company, not just in the weeds of your technical qualification. And so having a formal board meeting can be helpful for founders to help elevate that or change that, that hat that they wear or change the thinking from a, from a kind of where do I sit on a board? I think that there's a, a huge difference from being on a board with a startup. And I spoke about this before in terms of whether you're protecting uh, what you've got today or whether you're looking to the future. And I think that uh, directors on startup boards or early stage company boards need to recognize that the, their job is to capture the, the future that is possible, not, and to support the team and the founders to, to achieve that, not to create governance and um, risk management to protect what is currently there. And if you look at the, the, the normal structure of a board, it's very much around 
how do you create the governance, the checks and balances to make sure that this ship doesn't go off course? And, but for me, for an early stage company, it's really the opposite. It's really like, how do we, how do we support? How do we build frameworks? How do we give structure to this team to make sure that they can achieve their potential? Uh, and so it comes with a huge amount more trust, a huge amount more faith in the executive team or the management team than it would on a kind of a later stage board where you're really the, the governance structure or the checks and balances um, to make sure that things stay on course. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you have, um, like, can you talk about what that sort of looks like in practice as well? Like, you know, I think a lot of the time it can be very easy to not just kind of think about the future, but I guess even just have your own view on what decisions a founder should make uh, versus I guess kind of their particular view or, or kind of how they want to go about making decisions. How do you, um, like, what, what does that actual process in sort of building out that future or supporting what the future looks like look like in practice? Yeah, so I think from a fundamental point of view, it's it's worth acknowledging that we have we have no control provisions as investors. We're always minority investors. At the most, we might be around twenty percent of the company. Uh, we're normally far lower than that. So, and if we're on a board, we are one seat of three, four, five, maybe six, seven seats. And so, I think that the as an investor, you need to acknowledge that you're not you're not there to have control and you're not there for the founder to do what you, what you want them to do. You're there to, you're there to support them and to help them achieve what they want to do. And so you can, you can guide them. And uh, an example that I've thought from an analogy that I've thought about is maybe like bumper bowling. Like you can, you can keep the ship on course. You can provide some guide rails, but fundamentally like the, the bowling ball is going to go where it wants to go. And it, actually, I, I think there's a truth about um, working with people is that you actually can't get people to do a good job on something that they want to do. So, there's, so on something they don't want to be doing. And so act, you, there's no point in trying to push them to do something that you want them to do that doesn't for them feel, fill them with joy and fill them with kind of a feeling of fulfillment and that it's the problem that they want to be solving in the way they want to be solving it. It's much, it's much better and more effective to find the intersection where what you want and what they want is the same thing and, and push hard on that and, um, and encourage them to go, to go in that direction. I think a lot of the help that I can provide with founders is helping them articulate actually what they want or focusing on the nugget of truth underlying and strip away maybe some of the fear or the, the insecurities or the, the, the challenges that are holding them back and unblock them from that stuff. It's very rarely that I'm suggesting a way forward, which is new. It's like, that's just not like, uh, I don't think founders are short of ideas. It's like, that is not what they need. Really. They need support in terms of clarifying their ideas, stress testing it, working out the way to execute it. Yeah. So that's, that's the role I see myself playing. So I had a feeling that our interview would go a little bit over time. So I did check with Adam that he's got a little bit of time booked in um, after nine o'clock as well. So final two questions for me before we shift gears to move to audience Q&A. So if you have any questions for Adam, please submit them uh, via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Doing research for this interview, I did uh, text Will and um, ask him for particular stories or kind of interesting insights that there might be uh, that might be worthwhile picking up. And one of the things that he mentioned was radical candor and a specific example around a time when I think he suggested changing the name of a, of a portfolio company. Um, do you want to talk about what, what did that entail? Uh, so I think I feel really lucky to work with people where radical candor is appreciated um, because it certainly is my style and what, what I expect from people when I work with them is like, I expect them to tell me what they think and Will and I certainly have that relationship and he, I, I, this story has come up a couple of times. So I, I think he's probably more traumatized by this story than I, than I understood originally, but there's a, there's a, there's an instinct inside you when, when a company is, is struggling that um, you might be able to help them. Like you might be able to provide the kind of the silver bullet that solves the problem that they're going, that they're challenged, they're challenged with. And that's an alluring instinct, right? Like it would be nice to feel that way. And one of our companies was in that position and 
has a name which is kind of like it doesn't mean anything to their company and there was a thought that if they had a name which was more relevant um or it, like more directly describing what they do they that they might be do a better job of communicating that to customers and i think my quote was that to him that that was the stupidest idea i've ever heard um <laughs> which he took very well um and i uh, but has reminded me about it a number of times so he certainly hasn't forgotten but in, in that case, it was clear to me that the, the best companies are not there because their name tells you what they do. Like Google, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, like none of these companies have names which um, describe at all what they do. And so clearly for me that that, that wasn't going to solve this company problems and it wasn't, we weren't going to be able to ride in like knight in shining armor. Here's a new name, problem, crisis averted, problem solved. And so I think uh, I, I put that idea back in its box and I'm, I'm a hundred percent sure that I've also come up with just as stupid ideas and um, Will has put me back in my box as well. That's a great story. And I think, uh, I think a very sort of accurate representation as well. I think a lot of the time, not just investors, I think in general, even as founders, it's very easy to think like a particular pivot or particular idea, marketing idea will kind of suddenly change everything. And, um, you know, it's really about sort of the fundamentals of, of the business and whether that's actually working or not uh, as well. So again, final question for me before we shift to audience Q&A. Uh, one of the things that Morgan and I were speaking about was, uh, was kind of relaying some of the kind of strategic kind of advice or, or insights into particular things from a poker perspective. Um, and I know that you're a big fan of poker, so we've played a couple of times. What's your poker strategy? And how does that sort of uh, translate to how you think about sort of investments or making bets? Hopefully I'm a better investor than I am poker player. Um, but I do, I do love playing poker. What it, what is similar to me, I think is that when you sit at a poker table, you can feel what you can feel the vibe of the table and you can, you can feel what it needs and whether there is someone on the table who is being the aggressor or whether there are too many aggressors and you, you need to play a little bit more cautiously and kind of play, play closer to your chest or, if there's no one being that kind of aggressor to, to take that role and to, to, to feel that, to feel where that role is. And so I certainly feel that when I work with companies and I, I had this, this great experience where at the exact same time I had one founder who I was helping, who really was kind of not going as hard as, as I knew that they wanted to do. They were holding themselves back. And so my, my, most of my conversation with them was trying to help them, um, push through the barrier of like what was holding them back from going as hard from from investing as deeply into their into their growth as they could and at the same time had another founder who was probably being a bit too reckless in that sense and had too deep a burn and so my role in that situation was to to kind of help them see the risks of what they were doing and so it was like I, I was playing the exact opposite character in these stories were in their companies and they obviously didn't see that I was doing both of these, like each founder kind of um, only has a direct relationship with you. They don't see what you're doing at outside. And so for me, that was really interesting and it definitely showed me that I need to be, make sure that I'm thinking about what I do and making sure it's relevant to the company that I'm helping and that I can't be just one type of investor, one type of advisor all the time. I need to be a lot more nuanced to exactly what the needs are. And I think that that is true in poker as well. But as I said, I think I'm, I'm better at it in life than I am at poker. I know your, your poker game's pretty good. So uh, again, we're going to shift gears, move to audience Q and a first question that I'm going to pick out is from Grant Liebrandt who, who submitted Adam has impact investment gone up or down relative to conventional angel and VC investment. So impact investment certainly become more and more popular. So in that sense, it's gone up i think the financial returns the jury's probably still out on financial returns in australia for angel investment in general but uh certainly we don't see any downside for impact investment it, it's probably worth noting that in the startup space all founders are solving problems like that that is the truth about like if you are a founder of a company you are trying to solve a problem so whether or not its impact is much more around whether the other people around care about that problem being solved. And so it's not for me to say what might be impact to someone else. If they care, if they're investing because they care about the problem that is being solved, they want it to be solved. Um, that can be anything from like 
helping a small business grow through through better marketing tools like that that could be super impactful for someone uh, it's not that doesn't drive me but it's, it's totally legitimate as a as a theory that someone else might take and whereas for me it might be something around education um but that might not drive someone else and so i think that that in the in the startup land it's very different to in the kind of big business land where most big businesses aren't trying to solve problems like they're literally like trying to make as much money as possible or they're trying to extract as much value as possible and they don't wake up in the morning thinking about how they can solve a, a big gnarly problem um so i think in that world the nuance around impact is very different it's much more challenging in startups it's much more around just alignment of problem that you care about and problem that the founders or the company is trying to solve the next question that I'm going to pick is from David Elliott, who um, is asking, is Giant Leap currently looking at investments or is the fund complete? No, we're certainly live. We're still investing. We are looking actually at a couple of opportunities at the moment, um, investing in new companies and also doing follow on. What's the best way for, for founders to reach out to you? Uh, so I'm, on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, um, or probably the kind of like email address, um, which would just be adam at giantleapfund.vc. Perfect. And um, I know that I said that I was going to stop asking you questions personally, but you know, how's that? Um, how has kind of the effects of COVID and sort of lockdown, especially, sort of changed the, I guess, the investment process for you, or or sort of how how you go about approaching that investment? Especially, I imagine if you're looking at a couple of deals, a lot of that would be done through Zoom or through kind of other online means. Has that changed how you approach investment at all? Uh, it's it's changed very slightly. So we we've been a remote team across Melbourne, Sydney since inception um, and so although we did we did have monthly meetings where we would all come together we now do those virtually but that meant that we did a lot of pitches um, and a lot of meetings across team through through zoom anyway and so I don't think that that has materially changed our process I think that um, it, it's probably harder to build new relationships on zoom and so you have to, it probably takes a couple of more meetings and probably have to work a little bit harder to uh, spend time with someone because you lose a little bit of body language, you lose a little bit of um, the cues you would get from in-person meetings. But in general, for us, it's business as usual from that front. I think the possibly one other change is um, we're, we're probably thinking deeper about or or more strictly around runway and follow on capital requirements. And I, I would be nervous of companies who, who are expecting extremely high sales in the next six months, um, or were look, were, who required cap, another capital injection shortly after this one because of the level of uncertainty. So we, we would look for slightly longer runway and probably even more conservative financial projections. But I think that that is probably prudent across everyone at the moment in any case. Uh, the next question is from Max Lynham. And we touched on this uh, early in the interview, but you know, I guess what are the biggest specific detail, not general, hooks that make you fall in love with an investment opportunity? So anything outside of things that you mentioned earlier that have made you fall in love with a company? That's such an interesting question. Um, I think so. One thing that is is there's a couple of things that are fairly irresistible. Um, one is the founders who seem to be able to do things that should be impossible. So the specific things that this is like managing to sell to a customer who you know is a very hard customer to sell to, or managing to hire someone who had like on paper everything already, and you managed to hire them for less salary and um, uh, for for a lesser position, but because they really believe in the company or believe in the, in the team, being able to simultaneously increase your marketing spend and decrease your acquisition, um, like I think that the, like there's a, there's a whole lot of things where you have to stop and pause for people for people who can it, like seemingly make magic happen. I think that 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 definitely 
makes you take a second look. It's certainly not the end of the answer. Like there's a, there's a huge amount of work. These are, these are decisions we try not to make just on gut instinct. We try and be system, systematic. And so there isn't a silver bullet in terms of, oh, if we see this, we will invest. But if you, if you start to see a couple of different pieces of magic and it all comes together, it certainly makes the company much more likely to get investment. Uh, the next question is from Charlie McDonald, who works at Giant Leap Fund. And we also used to work together uh, at my last business as well. He's a great guy. And I love his question as well. His question is, what's your favorite question to ask prospective investee founders in a first meeting? I, I think that the, the, the first meeting with a founder is really trying to get to know them and what makes them tick. And so for me, the, the, the questions are around like why they're doing what they're doing and how they started and um, maybe maybe probing into a decision that seems like a decision that doesn't seem like they took the expected course um, and why ask them why they did that and try and unpack a little bit about like how they think about doing it. The other one that kind of leads to that is how they prioritize, how do things make it onto the roadmap? How do they prioritize what order to do things? Because you want to get, you want to get beyond the platitudes of like, oh, I really care about this problem and start to understand like actually what part of the problems do they care about and how do they think. And so you, you want to go one step deeper on those. But So those are the kind of leading questions that I'd ask and then hopefully they would do most of the talking. Is there any particular question that helps you figure out if there's magic there, if, if it's not obvious? I, no, I think, I think some of it is, comes from energy and certainly on Zoom, you have to turn the energy volume up um, because it's harder to communicate energy through Zoom. But that for me is probably like you, I, the, when their eyes sparkle, right? Like when they, when they get excited about something, when, when they really want to talk about something, I think that that is where you, where you should probe, right? Like that's the bit to go, oh, there is something interesting there. Let's, let's dive into that bit. Perfect. And final question is submitted from Dave Ray, who uh, wants to know, are we attracting enough of the best and brightest startup founders to impact? How do we attract more? So as I said, I think that founders want to solve problems. I think that we can find more, pro more founders who are solving kind of the big and gnarlier societal environmental problems. Certainly capital is one way to do that. And before we had Giant Leap, there, was, there were questions that were there enough founders starting companies that would be able to build a portfolio. And the, I was, I was never worried about that. I think that the, that for me was that you could build it and they'll come like it, it, a big, a big pot of money that is squarely pointed at a particular type of founder does attract that kind of founders. So I think that there are far more founders doing amazing work than we can back. And so I don't, I'm not worried about that. But yeah, I would love more, right? Like we have, we have huge problems. You can look at the United Nations social development goals. Um, there are huge, really, really challenging problems that we, we could try and tackle using, using financial means, using companies. Uh, and it'd be awesome to see more, more founders trying to tackle that. But I also think that that is the, I, I, I think we're, that's the natural cadence of the world. Like the, those problems are, becoming more prevalent, they're becoming more well understood and that is encouraging founders to try and tackle them and it's encouraging money to flow towards them. And so I think that we are on that trajectory and yeah, anything we can do to accelerate it would be awesome. Um, but I'm certainly not worried that they're about the number of opportunities that are there. I think that there are far more opportunities than what a small fund like Giant Leap could ever tackle. Uh, are there any particular problems or areas that are really spiking your interest or things that you're sort of particularly interested in? So I think the areas where I spend most of my, my interest is probably on inequality, FinTech for climate and um, health and education. They're probably the broad themes where I get most excited and there are like so many problems and so many solutions within those worlds that that keeps me really, really interested. I think the, the inclusion one is probably the biggest one where it's unclear how we use business models to solve the problems of inclusion because 
and there's some great examples, but it, it is, you're always going to come up with this kind of temptation that there might be a juicier market of people that aren't excluded. Like, so, and so if you're, if you're inclusion focused, it's hard to know how to stay pure to that and also make sure that um, that is the best market for you to tackle. And so there's probably some business model questions around that, but there, there are some great models. There's a investment company that invests in developing world called Leapfrog that invests specifically in um, those kind of companies um, where we've got a portfolio company called Applied, which does recruitment to remove bias and has this amazing ability that not only do they increase inclusion, but they also help you find the best candidate. And I think that that, for them, that business model really works because finding the best candidate is in everyone's interest, whether or not you care about inclusion, but they're really driven by inclusion. And so for me, that, that was a really great um, intersection of those two, those two things. Fantastic. On that note, uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. And Adam, once again, thank you for taking the time to come on the show and for sharing your experience and insights. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rohit. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to episode 125 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back at 8 a.m. next Tuesday, the 25th of August with another live episode. And my guest for episode 126 is returning guest, Ben Fistro. When I first interviewed Ben for the podcast in 2018, he was a country manager of Square. Next week, he'll be coming back on the podcast to discuss his latest startup, Zella, which recently raised $6.3 million from Square Pay Capital to reimagine business banking. I'm really excited about that interview and hope that you can join us. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.